still morning. Very good morning, everybody. Um, we're very happy, uh, I'm very happy to introduce uh, Mr. Bosselli. Uh, Simone, please. Simone, we are, in fr we are amongst friends here. Simone, from Erasmus. Uh, he will introduce him himself, but I, uh, 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 I want to explain why we ask especially him from Erasmus for, for this uh, subject. Because um, access and affordability is um, uh, a subject that's interesting for uh, every, uh, um, uh, every disease at the moment. And um, when you look at myeloma, which is uh, a rare, also a rare disease, but quite a big rare disease, I must say. Uh, but we uh, look for evidence in, uh, 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 because the myeloma patient group is divided in uh, several subgroups. You, uh, you, um, there are treatments that are um, uh, developed for, for smaller groups, and then you get the problem of access and affordability, the, uh, the pricing, etc. And especially, Erodus has a lot of experience in working with this kind of subjects. Uh, like, like your, uh, I, I think you have the three years to Mocha uh, project. And, uh, I'm going to explain about a Mocha here. Uh, yeah. and, and, uh, and you have ex expertise on the you know, uh, community advisory boards, etc. There are a lot of ex uh, they have a lot of experience, and we can learn from you. So uh, I'm very happy to introduce Simon Bosse. Thank you very much, Hans. Um, and for the kind introduction. And I will certainly uh, report back to my colleagues in uh, Paris, Barcelona, and uh, uh, scatter around Europe about your kind words, about your orders. Uh, hope that uh, we will meet the expectation. Um, my name is Simone. I can see that we are quite uh, uh, close. So I took off my jacket because it seems to be f uh, quite uh, informal here. So I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I'm Italian. I've been working at Eurodis for the past year. As a matter of fact, last Friday was my uh, first anniversary at Eurodis, but I have a, I've had 10 years of work previously in public health in Brussels. I spent uh, 13 years, the last 13 years of my life here in Brussels working in politics, um, as well as in consultancy, always on public health, public affairs and advocacy. My role within Eurodis is to look on one hand of all European and international development. So I work a lot in public affairs, advocacy and lobbying on European uh, uh, legislation, such as the current one that is coming in together with my colleagues on health technology assessment, which, um, which is going through the uh, European Parliament and the other institutions' co-decision process. Plus, I work a lot on all the other access issues, access and affordability, which is one of the topics particularly for uh, orphan products. But in general, the affordability of new innovative treatment has been on the, on the agenda for quite some time, and it's coming to be, it's, it's a global issue. It's not any longer a developing country's issues, but it's a real uh, uh, world issue. So, without further ado, today I will talk a little bit about uh, Eurodis, only very briefly, just to give you a sense if you don't know Eurodis. Uh, but given that we are very few, please do interrupt me at any point. If there is anything that you want to ask, anything that is not clear, do let me know. English, French, and Italian, no problem. Um, Dutch well, might be a little bit difficult, as I say, but hey. <laughs> Uh, in that sense. So, um, uh, from the briefing on from Alfonso, the idea is to, to walk you through from the, pr the, 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 uh, the discovery process linked to the regulation, to the regulatory, re regulatory framework, and that linked to access and affordability. Because the three in the current environment cannot be taken in isolation. You cannot take the regulatory framework alone, you cannot take the access framework alone, but they need to be all integrated. So, I hope. That's it. with this presentation you understand where where we stand in this in in this area. So then I will I will look I will look a little bit um, um, on the different mechanisms of expanded access, compassionate use, adaptive pathways or adaptive li licensing, but but also um, um, expanded access very briefly. Um, and then, uh, um, in the end, I will just summarize a little bit the current challenges, but also opportunities that there are in terms of developing the and improving the situation on access and affordability. So, a little bit about Eurordis. Eurordis is quite a large 
umbrella organization of uh, rare diseases organization across Europe and beyond. Um, we have close to 800 um, organization affiliated to our umbrella organization and uh, our structure constituted of uh, individual patient organization but also um, European Federation of Rare Diseases, take cystic fibrosis for instance, et cetera, et cetera. Um, as well as one of the things that we pushed in our a bit over 20 years of existence is the constitution of national alliances um, for rare diseases. And we have that pretty much in every, uh, every single country in the European Union. We have 40 plus staff um, that is based in Paris, Brussels and Barcelona, plus a few others that are working remotely. Flexibility is important in, in, in our association, so we have people working from Germany, from, um, from, from the UK as well um, as other countries. Um, 40 plus, it works on a number of different issues, um, particularly around our three key areas of work, which are patient awareness, patient, awareness, patient advocacy and patient empowerment. Particularly, we have quite a lot of staff working in um, uh, capacity building. We have, and I wanted to mention it here, we have uh, on our website, you can, you can see there our Eurodis Open Academy, which is all the training that we do through our summer school, winter school, and digital program. Uh, the summer school is uh, upcoming in June, and so um, in in enrollment is closed for quite some time, but it's very, very... Um, useful week in Barcelona, also in June. Barcelona in June is not bad. Um, and uh, it's uh, very much looking at every single aspect of the clinical development process, plus HTAs, plus a lot of other, a lot of other things for the empowerment of the patient community. Um, we have uh, staff working in uh, the regulatory process particularly, and the th therapeutic development, uh, et cetera, et cetera. This because uh, we have many challenges that uh, as a group, as a group of rare disease, individually, as you probably will know from the myeloma and the subgroup, individually, it's very difficult to make a difference. Uh, together, the rare disease community is co is, is got pretty much around 30 million people living with the rare disease in Europe only and about 300 million in the world. And together we, we, should, we should make um, a much greater difference because um, many of the, and probably let me know if these are the, some of the key words that you see also in your own individual disease, but uh, the knowledge is, well, first, first of all, patient and experts are scattered geographically so the, 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 the traveling of knowledge is always very difficult. Um, patients are often overall misdiagnosed, undiagnosed, misdiagnosed, and then they wait years for an appropriate treatment. One of the other things that I must, must, uh, must add at the moment is that out of the 6,000 rare diseases that are recognized, there are about only 5% that have an authorized therapy. And we're talking about um, not always talking about uh, disease modifying, mostly we're talk talking about ma management on the symptoms. Uh, the resources in general are limited, re reliable information is, is scarce, and we have lack of treatments and challenges to access ad adequate care, but probably I'm not saying anything new to you at the moment. So what we're trying to do is <laughs> a lot, actually. That's why we have grown into a, uh, a st it possibly a quite a quite a quite a solid organization uh, as uh, as a European Association for for Patient Go, because we are acting on so many different issues, um, and we are fortunate enough that through the, the the work that has been done in the past twenty odd years on rare disease specifically, we have been able to position rare diseases as a public health challenge where there is effectively a European added value. And in times where we live in politically, showing that uh, there is a, Euro a real European added value in cooperation is very important to us. Today I will talk, in, uh, I will talk how we are trying to address access to orphan medicinal products and treatment for rare diseases in the second part of the presentation. So, um, 
what I'm going to start with is particularly an overview of how um, the clinical development for drugs are co connected to um, the regulatory framework, but also then to the access to treatments. And then I will go a little bit into the more details of the regulatory process at the EMA, particularly for the centralized procedure. Um, let me know if you know about it and if I am either saying something that you already know or if I'm saying something that is wrong. You can always challenge me um, and then talk later about the access issues. So here you can see what is the typical, what, what is the typical um, process for at the top from, from, uh, from preclinical and discovery uh, phase through to mar post-marketing surveillance. As you can see, this is particularly valid for small molecules, so classic pharmaceuticals. The development for advanced therapeutic or medicinal products such as gene therapy or cell therapy might be a slightly different and even probably even more complicated. So this is a simplification um, uh, for the purposes of the presentation. But you will see that from the very high number of compounds that are possibly a likely candidate, we arrive at particularly the industry figures that they provide is between 2 and 10 percent uh, of the, the compounds that come to um, clinical trials, so phase one, and then they are approved. So it's a very, very difficult process, um, and that is also even more problematic in other areas with more complex diseases. So you can see this is very much drug discovery and preclinical phase is mu very much industry academia. In other in our countries such as the U.S., if you have, I have had the fortune to um, listen to a couple of uh, association representatives from the U.S. in two solid tumors areas, sarcoma and chordroma. And in the U.S., very much their foundation are very much also driving the drug discovery and the clinical research. Whereas in Europe, we are as a patient organization, we are concentrating on different areas. But that's probably something that we should explore. And then for the clinical trials, the sponsored or academia will, uh, will push it forward. And then very much from phase two, phase three, is the, usually is the company that brings it forward uh, towards uh, access. Now, um, what I'm going to talk about specifically on the first part is also what are the incentives of the regulatory framework briefly about uh, pushing for the discovery of uh, treatments for rare conditions such as myeloma, but many others. Um, and then going in particular on what the marketing authorization process is, then going to the next step, what, is, what are the requirements on health technology assessments and pricing and reimbursement negotiation, because that's very much where the black box of access is. Why I'm sure you all experience um, as European organization or international organization that in certain countries the reimbursement comes earlier and in others doesn't come at all. Sometimes the reasoning for um, the denial is price or affordability. Sometimes, in some other times, the agency done for the responsible for the assessment to use different type of assessment models. And there is one case on Revlimid that we can show that I will show um, later on, where the assessment differs from country to country, and you will understand why people, patients in some countries will say, well, why I'm not getting the same drug that is approved in another country. Um, then, always uh, talking about compassionate use and what, how we can provide some, a little bit of um, respite and try to ad address the, the access uh, problems. And also from a combination of um, regulatory and early access, the adaptive pathways and the prim priority medicine or prime scheme that is the European Medicine Agency. Now, I'm going to show you a very beautiful slide, very complex, isn't it? Okay, so I'll break it down for you. It is very similar to um, what I was talking a little bit before, but this shows in uh, one single slide is the uh, framework for incentives for drug development across Europe. So we're talking about what are the economic incentives, regulatory incentives, data protection incentives that are um, relevant for uh, drug development. I'll take the case for uh, specifically for all for medicine, but you see that the 
when when we were talking before about the number of compounds that are um, in discovery drops down dramatically and this is why from the um, industry point of view particularly there is a need for patents but also other type of regulatory incentives particularly for orphans uh, in terms of market exclusivity um, we see uh, specifically at the bottom that we have the process uh, that was specifically developed for orphan medicine or product in 99-2000 which, which very much um, helped creating the uh, new therapies uh, for rare diseases. If we think that before 2000 there were eight medicinal products approved for rare diseases and up to now we have now 143 medicinal products approved in the shorter space of 147, uh, sorry, um, 17 years. So that's that's very important and it shows that you might be aware that a lot of the discussion um, is focused on the high price tag that, that orphan medicinal products have, which is true and not true because in many cases, uh, in most cases, the mm, medicinal product for rare diseases do cost less less than uh, on average they cost around between 35 and 40,000 euro per year which is quite normal the, the percentage of the uh, orphan, orphan drugs that go into the six figures so above 100,000 uh, euro per patient is only is below 20 percent so it's a, it's a small fraction sometimes we <laughs> want the one of my daily job is to try to dispel the myth that the orphan, the, the, the budget dedicated to orphan drugs is going to completely broke the bank in the pharmaceutical pharmaceutical uh, budgetary spending. Uh, specifically, another example is that overall in Europe, 18% of the overall healthcare budget is dedicated to pharmaceuticals. Uh, up of that, 5% is dedicated to um, orphan medicinal products. 5% of the 18%. Thinking that that 5% for the moment is going to collapse or driving the collapse of the system is a little bit uh, difficult to understand. There are a number of, there are a number of fears, particularly from payers, um, to that, uh, that um, given the scientific advances that, that, that we have, and as we are discovering more and more therapies for rare diseases, that this 5% will increase and will definitely will have will be a problem. We understand that. Uh, so that and thus we are working towards creation of a framework that uh, would uh, help having more therapies at a lower price. So um, today I'm gonna briefly talk about the centralized procedure, which is at the European Medicine Agency which is the one of the two ways of um, uh, having a product adapter, but it is actually the only way that uh, innovative therapies can be approved in, uh, in Europe. Uh, by the way, so excuse me, um, many of these, as I, say, as I say courtesy of EMA, many of these resources are available on the European Medicine Agency website, which is very, we very well prepared sometimes a little bit cumbersome to navigate, um, but uh, um, there is a lot of um, valuable information there available on the explanation of the regulatory, uh, the regulatory framework. So you, you do have two. So in, in many cases, many, the, mutual, the national authorization procedure is still used for some uh, products but, and for all the products, so the, the mutual recognition and uh, the decentralized procedure are still there, but the centralized procedure, and I will show you a little bit later, is the one preferred for certainly for orphan uh, or for rare disease therapies? What is um, the centralized procedure? The procedure is one marketing authorization application for a whole 28, um, 28 member states. Is there anyone from the UK here? No. Well, that's going to be a problem for them in <laughs> in the future. But still. Uh, it sh well, the insurance that we receive is that there is already in place mutual recognition with third party countries such as the Norway and uh, Switzerland and so on. So in, that in, the, in this case, the most likely uh, 
escape way would be this third, party rec third country recognition. The UK, though, have been a very important driver of the European Medicine Agency in terms of expertise and knowledge, um, and that will be felt in the future. So the EMA proceeded to the evaluation uh, through a, a number of different committees, and uh, um, the authorization will be uh, available in all EU member states in all EU langu languages with a number of product information on the, some of the S SMPC, Summary of Product Characteristics, Labeling pack, uh, Package, uh, labeling and pa package leaflet plus a number of uh, obligations that come with the European uh, marketing authorization, which include post, post authorization studies, surveillance studies, pharmacovigilance, pharmacovigilance, etc., etc. Uh, one thing that uh, is causing us some trouble uh, in terms of access. So for the next the next phase is that an orphan first designation, but certainly for orphan authorization, is valid for 28 member states. However, there are 28 different markets with different procedure for pricing and reimbursement. This is the reason why certain countries like say Germany, which have uh, a, free, uh, a free entry at the point of marketing authorization, you will see that they have access earlier to certainly for rare diseases, but then they still have problems. Others, although theoretically there is in place a directive on transparency of the, pro the pricing and reimbursement process, this is hardly um, respected, and thus there is no still no clarity in terms of how long it would take to have a price a medicine reimbursed and uh, uh, reimbursed and available on the continuously on the market. So, uh, what are the medicines that are mand mandatory for evaluation at EMA? As you can see, most most of the, med the innovative uh, innovative um, medicines that are coming in will be going through the centralized medicine, the centralized authorization, particularly for uh, rare diseases, cancer, HIV, neurodegenerative, and all the main uh, diseases that uh, that there are also on more more um, complex procedures such as gene therapy, cell therapy and et cetera, et cetera. So this, before I go into the procedure and with a number of uh, um, acronyms, is there any question? Okay, so far? Okay. So this is the um, overall um, procedure for human medicine authorization. We have uh, um, a free main phases, one is a pre-submission phases, the evaluation phases, and the post-authorization phases. There are a number of different committees that are included, um, and I can provide you with the, the uh, different um, acronyms, but the key ones that, um, that are interesting for our community are the CHMP, which is the Committee for Human Medicine and is the responsible for all medicine for human, for the evaluation of all medicine, the, the COMP, which is the Committee for Orphan Medicinal Product, the CAT, the Committee for Advanced Therapeutical Medicine, or ATM, ATMP, uh, the PDCO, which is the Pediatric Committee, um, and uh, that's it. Then in the pre-submission phase for the orphan designation, which is, which I'll go a little bit later on, which is different from the orphan authorization or for medicinal product authorization uh, there are activities that are done at pre-submission phase at that point when the pre-submission phase is concluded then the evaluation for a marketing authorization application will start and will have uh, also the um, the um, evaluation for the CHMP once the evaluation is uh, from the CHMP is adopted then is transmitted to the European Commission for final adoption. Then when that step is concluded, the marketing authorization is finally granted and is valid into uh, all EU member states. Then there are many post-marketing authorization requirements, particularly around pharmacovigilance. And in the cases of orphan medicinal products or certainly all the therapies that have conditional approval, the post-marketing authorization phase is really important these days, particularly with the, with the um, uh, increasing importances in the collection of data, 
to ensure that, for instance, in the case of a conditional approval, so done at an earlier phase, um, is um, important to collect real world data or data generated in clinical in clinical practice to make sure that the um, effectiveness, the efficacy and the effectiveness and the safety of uh, the product are really happening. And then can go back to, to be to the European Medicine Agency for a full approval. So this is the process of a view overall for this for a general uh, um, H H um, uh, for, the, for the general human uh, medicine procedure at the CHMP. As you see, uh, the overall process should last no longer than 277 active days. There are two opportunities for a stop clock, for a clock stop, clock stop, clock stop, um, for a clock stop um, uh, where the procedure officially is stopped and so also the counting towards the 277 day. Um, in, um, in 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 this particularly at the list of questions and outstanding issues, there are possibility for the companies to ask for a procedure to stop the clock. Um, in particular, along this uh, along this um, timeline, the five key areas that are looking at is the evaluation of the benefit and risk, the assessment of the risk management plan. Um, the assessment on need for post safety and efficacy, sad, uh, efficacy studies, which again, for the medicines that are coming in for particularly for of, for rare diseases, we need uh, w there is a much greater need because of the uh, condition on which th therapies for rare diseases are developed. The small number of participants. Thus, the, the classic, um, uh, classic data requirements for medicine for more general, more prevalent diseases to, are not possible to be, to be met. So we need to have data based on very, very small population. Uh, and thus, con the continuous uh, evaluation and request for post-safety and efficacy studies um, is, 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 is much greater. Um, also, the other two points that are evaluated are the assessment of product information, the preparation of the RMP summary. Now, I am going to uh, talk a little bit about the orphan drug um, regulatory process because it's a little bit more complicated um, in the sense that there are two phases. One is uh, the, 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 um, the granting of a orphan indication and the second part is, uh, is the granting of the orphan medicinal product authorization. The orphan indication is that uh, the or orphan designation is um, a uh, pre-submission process that um, industry sponsors, but also SMEs and also academia can access to when they find the potential for a um, uh, for a drug candidate to uh, to target a small population. This will grant a series of incentives uh, for the uh, sponsor uh, in terms of uh, protocol assistance, scientific advice, broad advice that is available at the European Medicine Agency in view of a preparation of a, of a medicinal product authorization. In this case, when once it moves from the designation to the product to the to the authorization phase, um, and there, there is a di there is a different one. One of the perks of uh, all the orphan medicine product is that there is a ten market, ten years market exclusivity uh, for um, uh, for the product when approved. Now, many critics of this uh, legislation say that ten years is too long. Um, but uh, what uh, we can say is that. An orphan uh, marketing authorization and even the designation is not easy to obtain. It's not easy to maintain, and uh, it definitely uh, ten years is it, it. It definitely covers a very long period of time. I know of industry and of product that I've spent seventeen years, and just now without having a single product adopted, and being spending seventeen years of research and development, and just now 
having a product on the market. So for these uh, these specific therapies, and you know that rare diseases are mostly of genetic condition, 80% of them, um, it's it's very important to have enough time to um, to recoup the investment made in the current and existing framework. As you can see, these are data from um, of the European Medicine Agency itself. We have had a great number of orphan um, that have received an orphan designation, o almost th 17, seven, uh, 1,017, uh, 1,700 orphan designation. But actually, only 10% of them have turned into an orphan um, medicinal product authorization, roughly 10%. And this is quite, um, well, it's encouraging on one hand, in the sense that a lot of science is going into that, and we have a lot of um, a lot of uh, better knowledge about certain disease, how products are working, et cetera, et cetera. But on the other hand, how do we ensure that those candidates are turning into approved medicinal products? And that is really uh, so somewhere something where we need we need to work work towards. There are certainly regulatory procedures that are helping, like adaptive pathways, to start having candidates that are likely to ar arrive to authorization to arri arrive in the market earlier on and to gather thanks to um, better data collection system that we have these days collecting the real world evidence with the real world data that are necessary to confirm uh, the, the the efficacy of um, the medicine in question <coughs> so um, we have talked about um, the, uh, the 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 process, but now what type of auto uh, approval uh, can uh, can can arrive? The standard is mm, classic market market authorization, where the full package is complete. So the comprehensive data are there, full medicine author full uh, marketing authorization is granted. The conditional approval, which is something that is very <laughs> frequent in uh, in our um, in our field is where the data, the comprehensive data are not available and in rare diseases and the population are, so are usually small that some data are not, um, are not uh, uh, possible to, to, be, to be taken into account. I understand the medicine, the, the regulators are now a bit more flexible in, in, in trying to get different type of data available. But it still must fulfill some scopes. So definitely, the conditional approval is only dedicated to orphan drugs, emergency threats, and serious and life threatening diseases. It is not forever, but it's applicable for one year and renewable. And there are also other ex exceptional circumstances where um, comprehensive data are not available but must meet specific criteria on rarity, ethics, and scientific knowledge. Now, um, one of the now, any questions so far? Have I been clear? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Prime, which it sounds um, quite more funky in his uh, acronym than well, but his priority medicine is it is a new, um, new, relatively new because it started in only in two thousand and sixteen, type of approval that um, the European Medicine Agency has put forward, particularly to grant uh, faster access to a real innovative therapy. So um, it's in particular to foster the development of medicine with major public health interests, and I believe um, there is a candidate in there, in prime, for one uh, specific subset of mal multiple myeloma um, drug a CAR T cell therapy that is developed by I believe cell gene and is candidate in prime since November I believe. So what is um, what is trying to do is three things um, because of these innovative therapies are coming with diff. You know we're talking about specific therapies that utilize very complex mechanisms such as CAR T cells, but also gene therapies and so on and so forth. There are more. Um, scientifically advanced, but at the same time a little bit more difficult to uh, assess, particularly in, in with with regards to their long-term effects. So what um, it, it, it aims to do is to reinforce the scientific and regulatory advice, um, optimize the development for robust data generation, and enable accelerated assessment. And this is all based on something that we as a have been. Um, 
not to be fair, not only us, we have been advocating for a long time, which is the early dialogue between the regulators, the manufacturers, the clinician and the patient to us to ensure that there is a better understanding of the disease, a faster development of the product and accelerated assessment. Now, at this stage, and with a view of the access and affordability questions, we are advocating very much also for uh, the addition of a fifth um, uh, category, which is the one of the peers and the uh, evaluators, so HTA and competent authorities for pricing and reimbursement. This is happening, but it's slow, very slow, because there are still reticences and, and um, uh, issues around trust between the different parties. The eligibility criteria are very uh, naturally fitting for rare diseases because uh, it must uh, the, the candidate for prime eligibility have to have the potential to address a, to a significant extent with which we are talking up to life, uh, sorry, disease modifying treatments and unmet medical lead where there are no satisfactory methods um, existing that brings a major therapeutic advantage or a significant benefit. Uh, that are introducing new methods or improving in, in, in existing ones, and there are uh, meaningful improvements on efficacy compared to existing product. So we're quite awful for this, but um, uh, as in the case of adaptive licensing or adaptive pathways that I will show you a little bit later, um, we need to see how we can bring the access faster because this is a key problem. One thing that I did not mention before is that on rare diseases, on average, the time that is spent between marketing authorization and full access is between 18 and 24 months. That is different from having also continuous access through early access program or uh, compassionate use. So it's a major problem that, that, that is still existing. And this is bringing nice, nicely to me to the next part of the session. Uh, sorry, Hans, on we have until 12.30? Right, okay, so um, I think I'll have another few minutes on this and then I'll be happy to take any other question you might have. Um, as I was saying, um, th th there are <laughs> at least four key challenges that we see particularly in the in orphan disease space. Um, in the current system, a yes, the no decision for a marketing authorization or reimbursement for a rare disease therapy ten, can take up to 10 years, if not longer. More problematic is the fact that once a medicine is approved, about a third of our population does not, or a third of the population that would be in Europe eligible for access does not have, we're talking about 30%. So that is uh, quite, um, Import, uh, quite important, and then another third only w only um, only arrive at uh, access only after um, several years, several some mon months, years of waiting, um, and then that we have the inequalities that are present between countries, north, south, west, o o east, west in Europe, where certain countries and even region within countries do grant. Um, uh, approval at different stages. I was um, uh, just this week looking at a case where an approved medicine for Duchenne muscular disorder in Spain is approved and reimbursed in certain region, but one other is not. And in many other cases, like in the UK, when we talk about the term of postcode lottery in terms of what type of treatment you can re receive, you the parents of uh, this a child with uh, Duchenne um, consider moving from another to another region just to access the, 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 the treatment. And I personally don't think that this is acceptable, but there are uh, difficulties within the system in ensure affordability. Um, and uh, that is leads me to the fourth point, that is the cost. Now, um, this is possibly true, and we see that there are not always prices that are responsibly or responsibly set, um, but the system per se is a bit broken in our view because for rare diseases the European level is the right level 
to negotiate a price because you can even negotiate price per volume contract. But this is not happening because on the one hand, <laughs> there is a request for confidentiality in terms of the agreement. And it's not just about the industry that don't want to disclose the price. It's also about the competent authorities that do not want to disclose the price compared to the one that, that it has happening in other countries. So it is the system. You cannot blame one of one of the other. It's the system that needs to be fixed. Um, in when, when it comes to assessment, for instance, that is one of the key problems that has been trying that the current proposal, uh, legislative proposal on the table on HTA or health technology assessment at European level should try to fix, is that many different assessors, whether it is an assessor, use different systems f for assessing the same drug. And the result is that the same drug has different approval for reimbursement in different countries. And even then, at because reimbursement drugs for specific diseases is always a political decision, it's many, many cases a political decision, uh, some, sometimes even this assessment is not, the assessment previously indicated is, is not followed. So there is no transparency in the system. We really hope and we're really supportive of this proposal on for HTA cooperation in Europe that this will bring at least for the clinical value assessment real transparency and real clarity of how the scientific value of the clinical value of a product is assessed throughout Europe to reduce the inequalities that that there are. Because this is an acceptable, that is it was talking about Revlimid, as you can see, at the time of reimbursement, now I believe the 10, mark, ten years exclusivity for Revlimid is ended in uh, last year. So generics will come here, ge generics will come in. So that will be potentially savings in the system, but not reimbursed in 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 uh, in the UK. Reimbursed conditional with the restriction in other four countries, uh, and not assessed in uh, in France. So. You see, this, the, the system is leading to the, the, the different inequalities. One possible solution is the adaptive pathways, which is really clearly one of the ways that you could start the overall dialogue much earlier stage with the involvement of the five key categories of people that need to be involved and should look at, you know, in cases of conditional marketing authorization, you, how do you... Um, have the data available on how to, can you con connect the data to um, uh, to have available an assessment for for a longer period of time, and how can you link the, those data to adaptive pricing and reimbursement um, criteria so that you can uh, oh, the, 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 the can be flexible arrangement put in place such as managing inter agreements, but that always needs a multi stakeholder approach. Compassionate use. Here uh, we have published last year a very um, valuable resource on compassionate use throughout Europe. This is a partial response to the issues of access and a partial response that in if every country would uh, adopt the ATU system in France would be much better practice, but that is not the case. Um, it's a possibility. Um, but a compassion that, that takes place prior to registration of a medicine, but not all countries benefit from an efficient scheme for compassionate use, and still there will be maintaining the differences in access between countries. So this is a possibility, and in that in that uh, position paper from uh, a year ago, we provided uh, um, a number of recommendations for policy changes um, uh, to ensure that compassionate use is up taken up better uh, in different countries, in the countries where it work, Italy, Spain, might, 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 might not be the case to change. Now, I don't want to finish on a negative note, um, and as you mentioned, the MOCA. So uh, what we see as the solution to all the, the challenges that we had before is a collaborative approach between, mem be between different member states and an even stronger collaborative approach. Now, we have a, uh, we have, <laughs> um, Erodis and uh, has pushed, but this is a process that was, uh, st that stemmed from um, a European Commission initiative on uh, the transparency of, uh, uh, on the pharmaceutical, on the process on corporate responsibility in the pharmaceuticals. Um, that is called Mechanism for um, 
a mechanism for for uh, a collaborative uh, coordinated access to orphan medicinal products, which is um, a voluntary, confidential, and non-binding um, process that involves patients, manufacturers, assessors, and payers in the context of uh, the Medicine Evaluation Committee, MEDEV, which is a group that uh, groups together different mutualities and um, payers across Europe. So that is um, trying to really try to, um, in my experience, because I sit in, in, the, in the steering group for the past year, is really looking at how do we understand the product, how, do we, uh, it, how does a uh, manufacturer puts together the right data collection study in place to satisfy both the regulators and the payers, which might have might look at different set of indicators for the same product. So that's what we're trying to do with this, uh, with this, but also trying to um, simplify the um, the approach to the uh, assessment of the value through a transparent value framework, which is a much simpler, um, a much simpler um, way to assess uh, medicines and the, their value in terms of three, four specific criteria with three different type of degrees of um, uh, of value. So that could, you know, if you look at it from the European perspective, yeah. Transparent value framework. Um, that is what is, we have actually only been filling this one for the first product last year. And it actually works well because it gives you the, an, an idea at, at first glance. If it, if it is all red, red in particular if it's curative and has a, a, a high response rate, you see, you see clearly that this is a product that has value. But you can accommodate for different, uh, different um, problems or issues that, uh, that, that are available. And from a European level, you can see it that this it works for everyone. And then you can go at a different national or individual reimbursement uh, level uh, to see, okay, this might work in our budget, or this price might work in our budget, this not, might not work in our budget. Please. The transparent val value framework was generated by the process, process of corporate responsibility in pharmaceuticals. One of the subgroup was, uh, this was initiated by the European Commission in 2010 and the uh, uh, Commissioner for Industry, Tajani. Um, and that's one of the subgroup work exactly on this mechanism of coordinated access for orphan medicinal products and developed this transparency value framework. In the last three years, uh, we have assessed, or oh, this mocha, pro mocha process have been included in 14 pilot projects uh, on different, uh, different uh, products. And uh, um, we, as Eurordis, provide the patient expert so that the, there is a conversation with the manufacturer, with the patient, and the payers. This is part of the MOCA. But, yeah. but effectively, because of different stages of where the products came in, we have used it only, um, I think the first time was last year on a very specific product. And it worked well. And even the manufacturer said, this has helped us reflecting uh, on how we structure our value. How do we need to, what do we need to do else in terms of research? Ah, yeah. There you go. That, is, that, is, that, that I think this is, could be a basis for a much greater coordination. And you know, or we are aware of the different type of cooperation on joint negotiation between countries, the Beneluxa, Beneluxa in our approach, but also the Valletta Declaration in terms of negotiation on prices and grouped in amongst countries. That's it. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, Thank you. TVF is an interesting uh, table, uh, uh, but do you integrate also the, um, uh, the people of the EMA in, in this MOCA process, for example? Yes. That the first yeah, time well ever that happened was in September last year, so is it is, it is coming. And in a number of, um, uh, that is the fourth part that you need to integrate, so the regulators, uh, and this is happening, but it's happening as at, at a slow pace because in the end, you need to convince them after the after the mocha demo. I think. Is Sorry, it? convince. In the end, you, uh, we need to inf uh, to convince that group before uh, entering the market. The regulators. Yeah. 
Uh, well, if the product is not is not approved, then it doesn't go into yeah. the market. So that is yeah. certainly a, 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 pre a preliminary uh, condition for it. But uh, like in the case of uh, Prime, uh, we think that having a, a, a early dialogue to understand what are the di between all of these parties, <coughs> including the patient, is necessary to make sure that the data that are gathered do satisfy their regulators first, and then the assessors, and then sorry, the evaluators, and then the assessors, and so that we don't waste time, because if you have to do them in sequence, then it takes much longer to have an approval. Thank you. Any other question? Please. I saw uh, on the one of the first slides that you mentioned something about patient mobility. And I mean the cross-border yes. accessibility. Yeah. Um, my question was, Do are there any databases or some evidences on how to do this for countries who are not uh, yet affording or huh. reimbursing some I know there are some regulations, policies, um, uh, European policies, national policies, but just yes. wondering if there are some more details. To I know. gave you an example um, that might be more practical. It's the case of a product called for a for a rare disease called Adaskid, which is an immune deficiency disease, which, um, in uh, more figurative terms, the pa the patient with this disease are called bubble babies. Those are the babies that are born with no immune system and they have to stay in hospital forever, no, or as long as they live. Um, there is one treatment that is, effic effic that is perfectly effic efficacious. It's called Strimvelis and is given at the hosp Hospital San Raffaele in Milan. Uh, this disease is very small, very rare. We're talking about 10, 15 live births a year. So many um, people from the people that, that have that have been able to access this treatment through the system of uh, recognition of uh, social system between countries, not through the cross-border healthcare directive as yet. Uh, what we know is that the cross-border healthcare directive, whilst they have some very good points, such as the constitution of the European reference networks, um, it doesn't work so well in the prior authorization of accessing medicinal products once that are not available in one country. So if that is the case, you still have another possibility, which is a 2004 regulation to access, uh, to demand, to, to request for the access and re recognize the, um, the, 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 the expense that you have had through the system. The Hospital San Rafaela has extensive experience in doing this because that is really the core, the core of their work. So they can find ways on how the necessary paperwork should be done. But when it, when it talk when it talk when, when we talk about innovative treatments, that is not always the case. It's always and this is when one of our recommendations, particularly on compassionate use, and making sure that if in a country there is a compassionate use under the cross-border healthcare directive rules, they should be able to access in this compassionate use. But that is not always happening, particularly because the most innovative ones are rather expensive. Close. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's not. It's not. It's not easy to do. I mean, it, at the summer school, which I encourage you to participate, yeah. you got yeah, a yeah, day. Yeah. yeah, you got every. You know, half day session on, spe on each of the specific ones. So, condensing it in an hour, the two areas, it's uh, perhaps a lot, but hopefully, I've done a good job in doing it. Thank you.
That's much appreciated. My, my daughters will love it. 